Hello everybody, Kurt Sasek here. Riesling, that's what we're gonna talk about today. Okay, Riesling is the name of the grape, it's also the name of a wine, all right? Now, most of you are probably familiar with the really sweet Rieslings that sell for 10 to $15 a bottle, okay? And look, if you like that, great, teach their own. But the world of Riesling, there, there are so many Rieslings out there, it's, it's a shame that they, the other Rieslings don't get the attention they deserve. For example, did you know that Riesling is the most versatile grape variety on the planet? That's right, Riesling can be sweet, as you're probably familiar with. It can be semi-sweet, it can be dry, it can be off dry, it can be bone dry. It can also be sparkling, and apparently there are red Rieslings. I've never seen one, I would love to try one, but it, it, it covers the gamut, you know? It's kind of like, um, like if you could contrast it to Cabernet Sauvignon, well, how do you see Cabernet Sauvignon? Well, typically in one of two ways. It's either uh, a big, bold red wine or it's used in blending. So the grape variety Riesling dates back to the 15th century, okay? It is the 20th most planted grape variety in the world. It's one of the top three white wines along with Chardonnay and Sauvignon Blanc, okay? Rieslings are known to be very uh, terroir expressive. What is terroir? Terroir is basically the, if, uh, it's the environment. It's the soil that the grapes, that the vines, the grapes attached to are growing in. It's the environment, the rainfall, the climate, everything, okay? All of those things affect the way a wine is ultimately gonna taste, okay? But the Riesling grape variety tends to express that terroir more than other grape varieties, okay? Rieslings are typically made with 100% Riesling grapes, okay? Now, let me elaborate on that. Now, it's different in different countries, but I'll focus on the United States. In the United States, by law, if you're gonna call something a single varietal, meaning if you're gonna call it Chardonnay or Cabernet Sauvignon or Pinot Noir or whatever, by law, it has to have 85% of that grape variety in the wine. So you can buy a wine that is called Cabernet Sauvignon and there's no other grape varieties listed or Pinot Noir or Chardonnay, and that's the only grape listed on the bottle. But by law, 15% of that wine can be made up of other grapes. So by law, it would be 85%, we use Cabernet Sauvignon, 85% uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, and then other grapes can be used to blend into that wine, okay? So just a little, I don't know, fun fact for you. Rieslings, typically 100% Riesling. Another thing about Riesling is, at least I have never heard of it, they're never oaked, okay? Uh, and Rieslings also do not go through malolactic fermentation. What is malolactic fermentation? Malolactic fermentation is a process that, well, let me put it in layman's terms. It is a process that basically softens the acidity in the wine. If you've ever had a wine that has that creamy, buttery characteristic, kind of, almost kind of soft, well, there's a good chance that that wine underwent malolactic fermentation because that's one of the results of malolactic fermentation, giving you that buttery, creamy kind of character on your palate. Now, Rieslings do not go through that. Because they do not go through malolactic fermentation, it helps retain their, their natural acidity and tartness, okay? So think of wines that are crisp and clean and have a bit more tartness and acidity to them. Pinot Grigio, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling, duh, we're talking about Riesling. Okay, uh, Albarino, Gruner Veltliner, okay. These wines all have something in common. They have uh, that, that kind of clean, crisp tartness and acidity to them. I typically classify white wines in three categories, okay. You have the, the sweet whites, Moscato, Sauternes, Muscat, things like that. Then you have the whites that are more of the buttery and creamy kind of character. A lot of times they may use oak, so you're gonna get that oak in there. And then you have the whites that are the more crisp, have a you know a bit more of a presence of, of some acidity and, and tartness to them, okay? And that last categorization or classification is where I would put Riesling along with the other wines I just mentioned, Albarino, Sauvignon Blanc, so on and so forth, okay? Now, what are the most common areas of the world that make Riesling? Well, there's quite a few. Canada, USA, Luxembourg, Austria, New Zealand, Australia. 
the Alsace region of France. Alsace is in the northeastern region of France and it borders uh, Germany, Switzerland, and I believe Luxembourg. And then there's Germany, okay? But today, I'm gonna focus on two regions in particular. I'm gonna focus on Germany and Alsace, okay? Now, there are some similarities in the winemaking styles of Riesling between Germany and Alsace. And well, part of that is because of the unique history of Alsace. Alsace throughout history has changed hands, shall we say, between French and German rule, okay? Okay, so let's do a little bit of history on Alsace so you can understand the relationship Alsace has with Germany and France because, it, as I said, it's changed hands uh, uh, under who ruled that region throughout history. I'm not going to go through the entire history of Alsace. I'll just go back to 1674. Louis XIV in 1674 to 1871 claimed French sovereignty over Alsace. From 1871 to 1918, Germany took control of Alsace after the Franco-Prussian War and the Treaty of Frankfurt. Then you had the Treaty of Versailles. So from 1919 to 1940, it was under French control. Then after World War I, you had the Treaty of Versailles. And from 1919 to 1940, France reclaimed Alsace and claimed French sovereignty over, over that region. Then we have World War II, Nazi Germany conquers Alsace. From 1940 to 1944, Alsace was under German control. Then fast forward to 1945, and it is back and has been ever since under French control. Now, Alsace Rieslings are gonna vary in dryness and sweetness, okay, considerably. The German Rieslings, uh, they, they tend to have more of a notable sugar content. Now, I'm not suggesting all German Rieslings are going to be sweet like Moscato or sickly syrupy sweet, that's not true, okay? So now let's talk about Germany, okay? Germany being one of the predominant Riesling producing regions of the world. So what are the main wine producing regions in Germany for Riesling? There's the Moselle, the Rhine, the Rheingau, and the Fowls. I hope I said that right. I don't speak German. I did practice it, but forgive me if I didn't get it exactly right, okay? Now here's a little trick for you to tell if a Riesling is from either the Moselle or the Rhine. If they're from the Moselle region in Germany, the bottle will be green and slender. If they're from the Rhine region, they'll be brown. Now let's talk about Germany's wine classification system because it's unique and it's not like anything else in the rest of Europe, okay? The German wine classification is different because, well, let me back up. The wine classification... Now let me touch on the German wine classification system. The German wine classification system is unique, okay? But before I get into that, let me tell you about the rest of Europe. The rest of Europe has classification systems in their respective countries that base the quality of the wine on a number of factors. It could be, you know, how the wine is made, what grapes are allowed to be used, uh, uh, you know, where it's grown, how much is made, how is it aged and fermented, so on and so forth. So it's, it's more based on the quality of wine, okay? So like you can have a table wine and then you can have a Grand Cru wine. Germany is different. So in Germany, the measure of the wine quality is based on the ripeness of the grapes or, or the sugar levels, okay? So I'm gonna take you in order of increasing levels of sugar levels in the must, and I'm gonna go through each term in the German wine classification system. First term is called cabinet, which literally means cabinet, okay? And if you ever see that name on a label, it looks like this. The second level is Spatlese, which means late harvest. The word Spatlese on a wine label looks like this. The next level is Auslese, which means select harvest, okay? And the word Auslese on a wine label looks like this. The next level is Baron Auslese, okay? Which means select berry harvest. And the word Baron Auslese looks like this. The next level is Trocken Baron Auslese, which means select dry berry harvest. And that word looks like this. Yeah, it seems like the higher we go, the more syllables, right? Okay, and then finally, the last one, and actually this wine you may be familiar with because you see it pretty frequently. It's called Eiswein, or translated, ice wine. So what does that mean? Without getting into technical details, the grapes are allowed to freeze on the vine. And what happens is, 
the, the water evaporates, and the result is you get a more concentrated flavor in the wine, okay? I don't like sweet wines, but I have had some ice vines and they're fantastic. Don't think of these high quality German sweet wines like you would, you know, the, your $15 Moscato you get at Whole Foods or something. There is a whole nother world and I strongly advise you to check them out, okay? Can Rieslings age? Yes, they can. They age wonderfully. A dry Riesling, you know, you're gonna want it to age five, 10 years. A uh, semi-sweet Riesling, 10 to 20. A sweet Riesling, 10 to 30, okay? Now, I have heard on several occasions of people drinking Rieslings that are 100 years or thereabouts old, and they are wonderful. Also remember, the more sugar content in the wine, that helps preserve it and it helps it age longer, okay? Think of fortified wines like Port and Madeira, stuff like that, okay? Those wines have a higher sugar content so they can age longer or it helps them age longer. How much should you spend on a good Riesling? Well, I always tell people start in your low 20s. You can get some good Rieslings for that price point, but you definitely want to start your 20s, okay? And I have found, like any other wine, the better the quality, the more you're going to spend, okay? Some people don't understand spending a lot of money on a good wine, and that's fair to each their own. But when you're exposed to these wines and you do experience them, you understand where that money is being spent, okay? Just like anything else, whether you get a, a pair of shoes, you're going to notice the difference between a $50 pair of shoes and a $200 pair of shoes, okay? Same with wine. What are you going to pair Rieslings with? Well, remember your basics when it comes to wine pairing, okay? If you have a dry wine, remember sweet foods, acidic foods, and spicy foods are enemies to dry wine. It's generally a horrible combination. Now, the more, the, the, the higher the level of sweetness in the wine, the more acidity, spice, and sweetness the wine can handle, okay? So generally speaking, for a dry Riesling, I like light seafood preparations um, that have delicate flavors, okay? For off dry or where you're starting to get some hint of sweetness, but still on the dry side, maybe I'll, I'll do a seafood dish that has a fruit salsa or a vinaigrette, or maybe a very light chicken dish, for example, okay? Also, Rieslings, actually, one of my favorite pairings with, with a Riesling that has a little bit of sweetness, kind of like an off dry, I love sushi. Sushi is fantastic with Riesling, okay? I also like it with Pinot Gris and Pinot Blanc as well, but sushi is fantastic with Riesling. Now, as you get into the sweeter levels, then maybe you're gonna pair it with some dessert or some spicy Thai curry or Indian curry, some things with some spice, things like that, okay? My last note for you on Riesling, if you wanna try some Rieslings, don't just go to Whole Foods and get some $15 bottle. No disrespect to Whole Foods, but it, that's, that's all over the country, so you know people can relate to it. Anytime you are trying a wine you've never tried before for the first time, go to a wine store where people know their wine, okay? And you're gonna have to start asking them questions when you go in the store to see who switched on and who's smart. Total Wine usually has good people. But remember this, when you go into a wine store, you gotta be careful. Some stores work on commission, so if you go, there's a store here in Texas, I won't mention its name, but the, the, wine, uh, the, the wine people in the store, they get a commission based on what wines they sell. So they may recommend you something to boost their commission, but it may not be the best thing for you. So you gotta keep that in mind. Another thing is, just because somebody works a wine, in a wine store doesn't mean they're an expert in all styles of wine. Somebody may be an expert in Italian wine, but they may not know German wine, okay? Or vice versa. So you gotta make sure you ask somebody, are you an expert in Riesling? Or who is the best authority on Riesling in this store, okay? The next thing you wanna do is always tell them, look, I've never had a Spatlaser before or a cabinet. I want a textbook example of what a cabinet or Spatlaser or Auslaser or Talking Baron Auslaser or whatever, I want a textbook example of what a, this wine would taste like. What would you recommend? Because you want to have a good point of reference. You don't want to just try something and it turns out it was a, a poor example of that wine and then your perception of that wine is tarnished, okay? Here's another fun thing to do, and, and this will cost a little bit of money, but maybe you can have a get together with your friends at home and you can share the cost. Go to a wine store, find somebody who knows German wine and tell them, look, we want to do a Riesling tasting party and we want one 
we want a cabinet in a Spat laser, an Owls laser, a Baron Owls laser, a Truck and Baron Owls laser, and Eisvine. Can you give me a textbook example of one of each of those? And then you try them side by side and you can see. And that's really cool when you can try wine side by side. Another thing to do is go to the store and get some cheap Riesling that's like 10 or $15, okay? Then go to a store and get a really good Riesling, okay? But you wanna make sure a similar style, okay? So you don't wanna get a, a, a cheap $12, $15 Riesling that's, that's sweet and then compare it to a $20 bottle of Riesling from Alsace that's dry or something, see what I mean? So anyways, that is Riesling for you. I hope it helped you. Please give these wines a try. They are fantastic and the world is, is only exposed to the sweet ones, unfortunately. Uh, and well, granted, there are a lot of sweet ones, but what the general public is exposed to is not the good ones. So check it out. This is Kurt from Wine Taster's Choice. Please remember we're on Facebook Live every Wednesday, it's, or actually I am on Facebook Live every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Central Time on our page, Wine Taster's Choice. We're also on Instagram. And while well, if you're watching this, then you're obviously on our YouTube channel. I am creating an entire library of videos that I'm adding to our YouTube channel. So thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more and we'll see you later.